everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler Kinney, and I am a, the senior diversity talent partner over at Open Door, and I'm excited to welcome you to this year's Unity Summit put on by One Community. I'm excited to kick off this year's Unity Summit with a great group of leaders today to talk about inclusive recruiting. Um, I'll start with a little bit about me. I joined uh, Open Door this last summer to help build out diverse recruiting and sourcing strategies, as well as launching programming within the recruiting team for early career development. Um, I've also been recruiting for about 12 years, starting an agency and then working across um, tech, finance, and consumer goods companies over the course of my career, all with a focus on recruiting diverse top talent. It's very close to my heart. Um, not only because I am part of the LGBT plus community, but because I've learned the value of unique human experiences, um, positively influencing companies' decision making, um, which in turn provides better products and services for our customers. I've also been part of one community for years, helping co-chair the work that the Millennial Advisory Committee is doing for one community, and I'm proud to be part of this group that is doing such major work for inclusivity, not only in the Valley, but across the state and even the country. So I will kick it over to Kenneth to introduce yourself first. Great, thank you. My name is Ken Walker. I am Executive Vice President of Diversity and Operational Excellence at Prescolis. And yesterday was my anniversary, 16 days at Prescolis. Um, which is pretty unusual these days, but um, we have 17 campuses across the nation and our focus is on getting black and brown talent into technology jobs. Thank you, I appreciate being here. Excited to have you here and learn a little bit more about all the work that you're doing. Um, next, we've got Laura Lynn Smith. Hi, yes, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So. Appreciate the opportunity to participate on this panel. I am the Division Vice President General Manager of ADP, um, our location here in Tempe, Arizona. I've been with ADP for 27 years and held you know, multiple different positions. Um, I moved to Arizona four years ago with my family um, from Southern California, so loving um, Arizona and our Tempe location continues to grow and we have positions available if anybody's interested in implementation, client service, leadership, uh, sales. So take a look at our website if you are looking for an exciting career um, in human capital management, jobs.adp.com. Nice plug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then we next we've got Naveed Lada. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Really excited to be here. Um, my name is Naveed Lada, and I am a business consultant at Southwest Airlines in diversity recruitment. Um, so what that means is I, I basically I think about diversity from all angles and all programs for recruitment throughout the company. It's a really fun, fun job. I've only been here for about six months, um, but my journey at Southwest started actually when I was in college, when I was an intern, and so then just returned several, several years later in this role. Uh, but my background has been in workforce development, working in nonprofit, working in post-secondary education, thinking about how all that connects to DEI. And so now thinking about it from this side or this perspective has been really um, kind of amazing and helpful. Um, in addition to work, I serve on the board of directors for NCAPIA, which is the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. Very cool. Thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, today we're going to be talking about inclusive recruiting. Uh, the key to leveraging LGBTQ plus inclusive diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace is to start at the beginning, which is attracting and hiring diverse top talent. Um, as the talent pool becomes more diverse, it's critical that organizations across all sectors step up their inclusive recruiting. This group here is going to feature, uh, as you've heard, is about several corporate leaders sharing their best practices and advice on why this is so critically important and how to effectively implement inclusive recruiting into all of your business recruiting strategies. So we will kick off some with our questions. Um, the first question that I have that I will pitch out to you all is, what does inclusive recruitment mean to you and to your organization? Laura, if you care to go first. 
Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. And I also um, want to mention that I am uh, the chair of the diversity committee at the Greater Phoenix Chamber. So I've had a chance to really get a lot of great best practices, um, you know, shared in some of our forums about um, diversity, recruiting, hiring, and promotion. And I think what what becomes really important when you're looking at inclusive recruitment is what does inclusive recruitment really mean to a company? Um, you know, there's many different facets of diversity, right? We have gender, age, um, ethnicity, sexual orientation. Um, it could be experience. Um, so really ensuring that as you are looking at your recruitment practices, you know, as a company, do your recruitment practices open the door for inclusive and diverse recruiting? Meaning, you know, looking at your job descriptions or the job descriptions written in a way that could be excluding any specific group, um, you know, in the community. It's also recognizing the talent that's in the community and ensuring that not only your positions, but your hiring panel um, of interviewers can reflect, you know, what is what the community is represented by. Um, so there's many different facets to inclusive recruiting, and I think it really does just start with: Does your recruiting process as a company open the door for um, strong applicants and talent from many different diverse backgrounds uh, to apply and, and be eligible for the positions? Thank I'll you. jump in. Oh, I'll yeah, jump in. <laughs> so Prescolis, um, we're a national IT technology um, organization um, focused on getting those in underrepresented communities into a technology career. And what I'll say is that representation matters. 85% of the learners that we serve throughout our national 17 campuses, black and brown, they're women. And so for us, we wanna make sure that our staff is reflective of what our learners um, um, should look to see um, as they enter their corporate jobs. And we model the behavior that we want them to take out to our corporate partners. So. I would say it's extremely important for us as an organization to make sure that we have um, diverse thought leadership on the hiring panel to make sure that we are looking across um, the spectrum of candidates um, and be very intentional in our diversity strategy. So, so when the panelists come in, I mean, we have um, conversations as a national leadership team and across all of our across all of our teams, are we really being intentional and in bringing in women, black and brown um, um, folks, LGBT, or, or trans? Um, we are making sure that we are very intentional to make sure that our our staff um, and our what I call our Prescolis ecosystem um, really. Um, is something that our learners can look at and say, ah, yeah, we see it. <laughs> they look like us. I can go next. Um, I mean, the only things I would add to that are, you know, for when I think of inclusive recruitment, what it means to me is um, removing barriers to entry. So oftentimes you're like taking a proactive approach and looking at all your processes and your steps and your stages. And just ensuring that it's not going to be a barrier to entry to, to any any folks that are represent you know that are not represented already. Um, I'm also thinking a lot about like how after you come up with with you know what are those barrier entries like or or processes to improve like how how is all of that embedded throughout your recruitment process um, and your teams and your stages, uh, and then ensuring of course that everyone is informed and trained because these things are constantly evolving and changing. Um, but it would, those are the only things I would add. I think you all made incredible points. I know, Laura, you had mentioned the job description piece. That's something that we have talked about within the companies that I've worked with and specifically where I'm at at Open Door. Um, 
we are thinking about how can we neutralize the text that goes out in our job descriptions. It's not just about removing, you know, too many soft skills or making them easy to read on a mobile device, but actually making them inclusive. And there's a tool out there that will help um, kind of remove uh, words that might read more masculine or feminine and make it more neutral and engaging for people. Um, and then I think, you know, looking at removing the barriers from every stage, from the application process being, you know, easy to navigate to the interview process being engaged and creating space where candidates can show up as their authentic selves and understand that the person on the receiving end is going to appreciate where they're coming from personally to help um, understand what they're capable of professionally. I think those two things go hand in hand. Um, and to also move into the hiring managers and the other interviewers being aware of the unconscious biases and the different things that exist to help um, candidates move through that process more seamlessly and feel engaged and connected to the business that we've that we are actually we're all hiring for. So thank you all for that. Is there any additional pieces before we jump into the next question? I'll take that as a no. Uh, so our next question is, how does your company approach inclusive recruiting and what are some of your inclusive recruiting best practices? I can go first this time. Um, I, I guess when I think about our best practices and just in general best practices in recruitment, um, there's really five things that come to mind, right? So one is establishing those partnerships with training providers, associations, and nonprofits so that for, the people are informed that these, these job opportunities are available um, and how are you continuing to partner with, with those organizations. Um, the second thing is, I think it's been touched on a little bit, but engagement and um, inclusive language, job descriptions, um, thinking about accessibility throughout all your stages. Um, the third, which is like, I think the most important one, um, which is data. Um, so how do you actually look at the diversity of candidates throughout all stages of the process? And is that actually carrying through from applications to interviews to offer? Um, the fourth would be interview panels, which I think Tyler, you just mentioned, um, but the importance of that too, reflecting back the diversity uh, that, that we're serving uh, to the, the community that we're actually um, interviewing and, and bringing on. Um, and then the last piece for me is, and I think you mentioned this too, but that internal training piece, which is so important. So how do you wrap up all of these best practices so that all of your employees, all your staff, hiring leaders, um, talent acquisition folks, recruiters, everyone's informed on, on how to actually like engage. Uh, but those are kind of like just five quick best practices for me. And very good ones. Um, I think we had, when you talked about the data part, I've worked in, I think it started when I worked at tech companies and they talk a lot. You can't argue data, a vice president once said to me, and I was like, that's very sound advice. Um, and so I'm actually excited to see a lot more tooling coming out from a recruiting perspective that will track the pipeline, kind of track that funnel um, of candidates moving through the process. So you can see if there are barriers at any stage in the process where you see a large drop of your diverse talent coming through that pipeline and then allow you know the company to respond accordingly and figure out what they need to shift. Um, Kenneth? Yeah, um, everything that Naveed said, um, one of the things that well, two things that we focus on at Prisco List um, recently that I think has been really helpful. So diversity of thought, um, intergenerational sort of interview panels, I think is extremely important. So I'm a baby boomer. Yes, I know, I'm a baby boomer. Um, but I think very differently than our digital natives, um, our millennials. And so as we bring in um, more folks, um, Prescolis is a 350 person organization and 170 of them um, got hired during COVID, right? And a lot of them are, are young to the business. Um, and so having a, having a panel where um, we are looking at baby boomers and digital uh, natives um, has proven to be extremely effective. The other thing that we do that I, I really like is um, we give candidates a thought exercise um, as they're coming into the organization. And the thought exercise is a little open-ended, right? And so we're really trying to, to get folks to sort of think through a process so that we can understand 
um, the different tools that they pull on, on when, when providing an answer. So it's not really about giving the correct answer, it's about how, how do you think about the challenge that we posed as an organization? Um, and hopefully we put you know, challenges on the table that relates to the job that they will be performing, but that thought exercise and, and um, intergenerational sort of recruiting um, has proven to be very effective. I can imagine. And I, yet I think it's definitely important to look at all aspects of diversity, including, you know, age, not to, not to measure, but to create that space for those, you know, for any individual to come into your process and be comfortable um, if, you know, as, as they are qualified for the role. Absolutely. Yeah. Laura? You know, I think that uh, my fellow panelists have really covered the majority of the, the best practices, but I'll just, you know, go a little bit deeper. Um, I think what's really great that, you know, many companies do is getting involved with the community partnerships. Um, I know that's been mentioned, but that really allows the opportunity for a company to connect directly with the members of, communi of the community and create the awareness that they're welcome um, and that they are encouraged to be part of that company and that, you know, they are, um, you know, they'll be supported and um, through their onboarding process and their development process and their promotion process. So I think, you know, a best practice for companies is to get involved with community groups you know, many community groups are nonprofits, so there's pay it forward opportunities uh, where you can also then connect with the members of that, of that group um, who many times may, you know, embrace a number of different uh, diverse, fa you know, diversity facets and ensure that those members are aware, hey, we are a company that is very focused on diversity and inclusion and we welcome you and we look forward to you being part of our family, right? So that I think is um, something that I know has been shared, but I wanted to just put a little bit more emphasis on. I think it's hugely important. We've seen, um, you know, so many different companies come out in the Valley in support of, you know, specifically the LGBT. G LGBT community, um, you know, and, you know, in other different ways throughout the community companies, you know, become involved with veterans and, um, you know, un other underrepresented groups across the country. Um, and the connection from a recruitment perspective um, allows for some good open dialogue on the spot to, uh, and it showcases um, their values, you know, and, and being uh, open and connected to their communities. And I think in turn yields uh, individuals being a lot more interested in their company. So um, really great there. And I think one of the things too, I wanted to share, and again, with my recruiting bias, um, we talked, Naveed, you talked about data. Um, I've seen a lot of different companies measure um, time to fill kind of that speed to delivery metric over kind of the quality of the experience or even quality of hire at times. Um, and in my company, we really only have a major metric around having underrepresented groups be included in our on-site interview stages. So um, we implemented that a while back and started measuring the success of that by how we saw our employee population, the diversity within our employee population shift. Um, and so at 25%, um, of an underrepresented group being part of the on-site stage, we have seen an increase in our um, female employees increasing to help kind of balance out that gender neutrality. Um, and then we have also seen areas where our um, different cultural groups have increased, but we've also seen to reduce. And so as a team, we come together and we kind of digest that data and figure out what are we going to do differently? How are we going? Would, where, which parts of the community do we need to go in to engage more deeply? Um, I, my team is actually working on a, a sourcing project that will find job boards and different community connections where we can go out and reach those groups where we have seen a decline or where we've got opportunity to improve. Um, and so we're doing that work as well. And I think a lot of companies 
um, can do that or have a lot of opportunities to build there and move sometimes, again, my bias, move away from that speed to delivery on hire and focus more on that inclusive experience for candidates and finding where they are. So our next question, what are some of the challenges that you faced in implementing or designing inclusive recruitment strategies and how have you overcome them? Laura, care to jump in? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, some companies, as they're thinking of one of the one of the areas that I mentioned at the beginning around a recruitment strategy is a diverse hiring panel. And some companies, you know, smaller, maybe mid-sized companies may not have leader, diverse leadership, right? That may you may need to look at how do we bring in that diverse thought and that diverse experience into a hiring panel, right? Because that may not exist. Sometimes that happens in smaller companies. So I'm just referencing some best practices that other companies have done is they may have um, pulled non-hiring managers into the interview process, you know, done some training with those, with those folks and, and, you know, provided them with the skills for interviewing. Um, right, because there's definitely interview training and interview skills that are important. Um, so they may bring in um, other uh, people to be part of that interview panel to have a diverse um, interview slate. Uh, so I think that that's definitely something that could be an option when a, when a company is looking at ensuring that you have some type of diverse panel conducting the interviews. I'll chime in. One of the things that um, we did that I thought was really exciting within the organization, um, about two years ago, we went on this exercise um, we call getting the words right. Um, and so we did a scrub of all of our curriculum, all of our materials for candidates who, who are looking to come into Prescolis, of our website, um, to make sure that we did not have anything in our materials that didn't feel inclusive. Um, and we included um, personnel from all of our 17 campuses because folks on the East Coast versus the West Coast, Midwest, you know, they read things differently. And so really just trying to make sure everything um, that we put in, in, in front of our learners, in front of our, our staff, feels inclusive, um, makes people feel as though um, they belong. And we've gotten really good feedback that the changes and the small tweaks that we've um, made to all of um, our content um, has felt more welcoming um, to folks entering the organization and our learners um, partaking in our our free technology training. Um, we also just recently did a profile of, um, of, a, of a learner coming into our organization. We call her Maya. And we, we really hammered on what barriers were we putting up in front of a, a, a Maya who wanted to come into um, our training program and found that we had about 40 barriers that unconsciously we just didn't think about that really prohibited a learner from uh, potentially coming into our training program. And so that was incredibly eye-opening. Um, but then obviously we went through the process of tweaking and changing and um, our numbers went up significantly. Um, folks were feeling a lot more um, included and, and, and barriers, they exist everywhere. And we have so many folks who need to get into this technology sector. And so from our perspective, we need to figure out ways to make sure that they feel included. Um, so those are a couple of sort of creative things that we've been doing to, to, to get more folks um, into the organization. 
can chime in next. Um, I guess like a challenge that, you know, Tyler, I think you spoke about too, right? It, it, the thing is, data is important, but it's also challenging. Um, so I know a few questions were also around that, about how do you track and how do you know? Um, so hopefully, you know, your companies are have access to systems and application and tracking systems and CRMs and other, other technology and tools that help you uh, find out what, what that actually means and what is the candidate drop off and what's the data that you have. At the same time, I think one, one of the things that we often forget about is there's this difficult conversation and space of thinking about invisible and visible identities. Um, so not you won't have access to every single identity of diversity and representation. Um, your data won't tell you everything. Um, but what are what are ways that you can still think about that and make sure it's not a barrier for candidates? Um, I know one of the things that I often think about quite a bit is intersectionality. Um, so we, um, you know, for us, for Southwest Airlines, we also do a lot of work with uh, military and veterans recruitment and disability. Um, and so that is part of our DEI effort or our DEI recruitment um, in, our, in, our, in our work that we do there. So oftentimes we're thinking about um, when you show up for uh, an interview and if you are uh, if you are interviewing someone from, say, a military background, how are, how are they able to talk about their transferable skills? What are the things that you need to keep in mind? Um, how are you ensuring that the resources and things that, that you have as a company are also front and center for that person to know? Um, so it's, it's kind of like this, this such a, I, I guess it, it changes for the different, different audiences that you're working with, but being mindful that you will encounter invisible identities and intersectionality along the way. Absolutely. I'm going to add two questions that have kind of come as a follow up to this best practices one. The first is what are some best practices in improving professional communication across generations in the workplace. And we can pause to think about it. <laughs> um, I, I guess. My thoughts there are, you know, I think when it's in the workplace, that means like it's it's no longer recruitment, maybe it is, but I'm thinking like, how do we apply multiple channels for communication, right? So is email the only option? Is the Slack the only option? Can you have multiple things that, uh, so that way you are including everyone uh, in terms of how they communicate? Um, I'm sure my, my fellow panelists have more thoughts there. I would agree. I've seen my company do kind of a multi-prong approach to communications to ensure that it is able to reach everyone. So we've got the Slack channel. Um, and if you're like me, you're probably less inclined to boost Slack, maybe because I'm an elder millennial. Uh, but I do, you know, there's Slack and then we'll have an email communication, but we also have our intranet. And so everything will kind of point to each other to say, you can find, you know, find this information here. Um, but I think that combination of, you know, resources allows for everyone to be part of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's, you know, the first thing is offer many different modes of communication, right? Whether it be through your internal um, chat systems that you might have, you know, in the office. I know there's WebEx Teams, there's uh, Microsoft Teams, there's many different ways to disseminate information that way. Of course, email. Um, Instagram, Twitter, you know, internal accounts. Um, many times it's just asking the, the employees of the organization, you know, just do some polling and, and it doesn't have to be formal. It could just be in round tables. You know, what's your preferred method of communication? It's the best way to get you information. I think the idea is offer multiple different channels to disseminate. Yeah, and we have focused on, um multi-sensory ways to, to communicate. And so podcasts, um, video, so our town halls, um, you know, we, we sometimes record in, in video. Um, we're, we're trying, everybody doesn't get information the same way. So yes, there's Slack, there's email, but sometimes when you see a video pop up in your email of the CEO or, or some team lead, um, I might be attracted to that. Um, a newsletter um, is also another way that we've been communicating. It sounds a little old school, but people like that sort of dense information in one place that gives a, a nice quick update. So we found um, professionally that we've gotten more um, folks engaged in, in different ways by being very intentional in, in, in looking at multi-sensory ways to communicate. How oh, amazing. Very cool. 
Um, we did have one more question while we're on this topic. Would love to hear some of the less obvious tweaks that any of you have made. Um, I think we all know to take names and other clues or cues about gender, parental status, et cetera, but what else? So as I read this question, one of the things I thought about, if it helps, is um, how are we capturing information about incoming candidates so that we we can identify, um, you know, if somebody is part of an underrepresented group or part of the diverse, you know, part of a diverse community. Um, and I have seen several applicant tracking systems that will actually provide a diversity um, survey upon application, or you could place at any stage in the process so that individuals can self-identify. And I think that has to be married to, um, you know, the company showcasing that it is inclusive and a place where people can be their authentic selves so that they can answer those questions openly and honestly. Um, and if an applicant, if a company's applicant tracking system does not provide that resource, um, there are other tools. I know one community offers um, some resourcing. I know SHRM um, here in Arizona offers some resourcing on ways that you can capture that information, whether it's a survey that you send out at some stage in the process manually um, or other things like that. But there is a ton of resources out there that can help with um, those things that we would we can't we wouldn't ask in an interview, but things that we would want information that's helpful to gather so that we know how to um, I guess, dare I say, prioritize, you know, uh, diverse talent coming into our pipeline. Yeah, we have a um, we have an inclusion by intention um, conversation series, and so we're a big fan of um, small group um, dialogue. And so, on a quarterly basis, we bring um, folks from across our national sites to talk about um, um, implicit bias, um, LGBT um, norms in the workplace. Um, um, we've had, we had a really intense conversation on race, um, but the people team and the diversity and culture teams of the organization sort of run that. And the input that we get from the, the folks who participate, um, we try to infuse that back into um, our recruiting practices. Um, and we found that to be really helpful to hear from the people um, within the organization. Um, and, and because they are so diverse, we get a lot of interesting sort of creative um, thoughts out of our inclusion um, um, sessions on a quarterly basis. That's just, um, it's improved uh, teamwork, it's improved collaboration, and it has improved the recruitment process because we use all of that data um, to help us bring in more diverse talent within the organization. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next question? And no. I guess, sorry, just one, one quick thought is, and I know someone pointed this out too, is that a lot of that information is um, you, you self-disclose when you're applying. Um, and so there's also the chance that people won't give you that information. That's okay too. There's a chance that, and as I mentioned, there are invisible identities that aren't always captured um, in, in any of the process, right? Um, and I guess one one thing that I would think about is as companies are out there and you're doing recruitment, like how do, how can you make sure? So if you're working with a nonprofit organization such as Priscilla as a training provider for tech, um, how how are you identifying the candidates that are coming through that to say this is actually like this is an awesome effort that our company is doing and working with a nonprofit organization that's specifically um, you know serving in, in, in thinking about like un underrepresented talent and technology. Um, and likewise, if you're working with one community or another organization or association, who, what is that segment of population that they're serving? And how can you actually think about how, how did that impact your recruitment? And did, did people actually come through this organization and follow into the, the stages of your funnel and actually get an offer? Um, and I'm wondering how can we actually use tools to, to think about that too? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so in our next question, um, what have you found to be some of the challenges to attracting and retaining people in the Arizona market and how can inclusive recruitment help? Q. 
Ken, you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm the one person who's on the national team and not specifically in, in um, Arizona, but, um, but our managing director, um, um, Jacqueline Bowles, um, she works really closely with our recruitment and admissions team um, in, in sort of targeting um, uh, areas within Arizona that we're looking to bring in our learners. I mean, we look at zip codes um, and, and really focus our recruitment efforts um, so that we know that the, the learners who are coming into our um, program are really those who um, are excited about a career in technology, who, who have a passion. Um, and so that comes through in sort of the conversation in the, in the online process. And so we try to glean all that data um, as folks apply so that we know we're getting um, those, those candidates that have the grit, the passion. Um, we love when they tell us stories about them being the the, the, the geek in the family that grandma comes to, to you know, fix the, the old computer, because those really tell us a lot about um, this learner's sort of appetite for the technology and willing to, to go through what for us is a 15 week sort of grueling program, um, very intense, <laughs> um, um, missing days is, is not a good thing, but we, we have a really good feel that we are getting in the right candidates. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always about intentional targeted marketing um, to make sure that we're bringing in the right folks who is reflective of our sort of national footprint. Thank you for that, especially from the national perspective. <laughs> that was the, the national, fly. yes. <laughs> and on the fly, thank you for that. Um, Laura? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think when you think about the, the talent um, challenges that a lot of companies are facing right now, right? There's a talent shortage and, you know, inclusive recruitment just really helps you open uh, the talent pool, right? Ensuring that you have, you have access to all talent that's available. So I think that that's very important, but I want to touch more on the retaining people part of the question. Um, and so when you think about it, right, it's let's retain our talent as well. Let's, we want to make sure that we're retaining our diverse talent and many best, you know, companies, a best practice that many companies have is affinity groups or employee resource groups where you're celebrating the diversity of all of your associates, you know, and employees, um, not just the employees who may identify with that specific group, but who are allies for that group. So allies can really create a very strong culture of belonging because if you are aligned to that group or you identify with that group and you have a bunch of allies around you, right? That helps create that welcoming and uh, trusting environment that so many employees really look for in terms of staying at a company. Because as we know right now, it's very easy just to leave your job and go get another job somewhere else, probably making more money. But does that other company welcome you the same way? Uh, that you're welcomed at your current company. And many times employees will stay at a company because they feel that they belong. They feel that that's their family. And that extra couple of thousand dollars a year, yes, it would be nice, but is it worth it? I think that's a great point. I think uh, belonging is key when we think about like diversity and inclusion. Um, I actually listened to a keynote from Pat Waters, who used to be the CHRO of LinkedIn, and now she's at um, Precor. But she did a whole write-up for the Harvard Business Journal about the belonging component of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think it speaks to that retention piece. But it's it's on the company. It's on a company to ensure that there is space for an employee to be their authentic self and to have values that employees can connect to and work that is meaningful. 
um, if they ever hope to retain them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only other thing that I would add is, I mean, the, the labor market is pretty tough everywhere, right? And one of the things that I think I'm noticing or, or seeing a lot of is education as a benefit from companies. Um, but one of the things that Southwest does really well is we also offer a career mobility program. So it's coaching as a benefit almost. But what that means is we are providing career coaching to all of our employees, giving back resources, connecting them to education programs and training providers such as Perscolas to say, if you are working on the front lines, how do you then upskill and move into a career in technology if that is your end goal? Uh, so thinking about that, I think that impacts your diversity, it impacts your retention, it, it's just it's good practice in general, as we think about um, the movement of economy and economic mobility and upward mobility. So that's just one, uh, one other thing that I would add. You know, I think that's amazing. I think that that education opportunity, um, and I think kind of ties into a benef those benefits components, um, and ensuring that a company's benefits will satisfy employees, you know, across the board. So, um, you know, things for family planning and, you know, financial resources and continued education, um, but also some things that might be nuanced. And um, I have seen, I, I was fortunate to be with a company that evolved some of their benefits based on conversations that were coming up out of an employee resource group. So the, you know, an LGBT plus resource group talked about trans medical care. Um, and while the company had like the pharmaceutical components, there weren't the other medical components that existed. So out of discussions um, came an AMA with the CM, uh, with the CEO on, uh, on Reddit. Um, and then in turn, all of the benefits were modified to ensure that they were more inclusive for everybody. So I think that's you know, leveraging groups and having discussions, but taking a look at your benefits holistically and, and inviting people to that discussion to see what can we do better um, helps with kind of that retention and, and also being able to go out to market to candidates and say, hey, this is what we offer. You are welcome here and we've got you covered. Yeah, this, this is a great conversation and two things that we've recently done. Um, we have a uh, retention plan. So we're intention, we created a retention plan, ways in which we can um, keep the folks and the talent that we currently have within the organization. Um, and we also hired a, a consulting organization, um, Notre International, to um, take us through, it'll be a six month DEIB strategic plan. And so how do we include all of our stakeholders at Briscolis, so our learners, our staff, our funders, our employer partners, um, our board, um, in all the, the key stakeholders within our um, ecosystem, um, being really reflective of the learners um, that come through our doors. And so I'm excited. Maybe you guys can invite me back in six months so I can share what the DEIB um, plan <laughs> reveals. Um, and and, and I, I feel like we're, we're sort of, as a nonprofit, ahead of the game to a certain extent. I mean, we have black and brown folks coming through the doors, 85%. But then at the same time, we're always never looking to be complacent. And so we're always looking to sort of keep, keep the metal to the pedal, is that the phrase? Um, but making sure that the conversation is continuous and all the documents that we create is not static, but it's something that we're revisiting on a constant basis. And then finally, back to the data, having KPIs, key performance indicators as to what success looks like when we put our DEIB plan in place. Um, we're gonna measure that and make sure that we're making progress. Yeah, I think there's no perfect algorithm to that, to any of this work that we're doing. It's just having your heart in the right place and taking the information that you've got and iterating on it to be better every day. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we are at our final formal question and then we'll jump into Q&A. Um, so why do you think it's important to consider diversity in recruitment and then how does that better the workplace and company culture? Naveed? 
Sure. Um, gosh, this is such a good question. I feel like the, I mean, there's obviously um, like business benefits of having a diverse workforce, um, but I, I guess like one, one thing that I always think about is that the future of diversity is not just recruitment, um, it's actually our product. And that's the reason we do this work. So how does, how do we then uh, take into account multiple perspectives and identities and improve our products that are in place so that we continue to serve our consumers, our, our community, our customers the best way possible? Um, so I'll add that and then I'll pass it over to some other folks. Laura? You know, so I think that there's been, there's been multiple business cases for diversity and the benefits, you know, just financially that a diverse organization realizes. McKinsey um, has done studies, ADP has done research on this. So there's a very strong business case to consider diversity um, in your recruitment process because it's been proven that companies that have strong diversity are more profitable. Um, and so I would encourage people, you know, to look up some of the studies, but, you know, how does it really better company workplace and company, company culture? Um, you know, ADP has a very strong focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think we have a very strong culture of inclusion um, and celebrating our associates. You know, I've been here, as I mentioned, 27 years at ADP, and I stay because of how we welcome and embrace, you know, our associates and encourage them to, to bring their authentic selves to work. So I think, you know, when you're looking at we kind of tie in everything we've talked about today when companies are looking at how do we attract and retain talent, um, recruiting diverse talent, onboarding them, welcoming them, uh, developing, promoting, that all helps with uh, retaining the strong talent that you have, um, bringing in fresh talent to make the company even stronger, um, and just overall creating a, a great culture where employees feel they are part of a family. And I'm just gonna add listening, very important, especially coming out of COVID. I think we're coming out of COVID, right? Yes, coming out of COVID, <laughs> um, we really need to listen to our people um, and take the feedback that they're giving us, right? So having a culture of feedback, embracing that, and, and feedback regardless is good, right? Whether it sounds bad or sound, it's information. And you always need to keep a pulse on the information that's coming in from your people. Um, because of what I would say to most of you, your culture is evolving. It's evolving. I mean, what has taken place in COVID unprecedented and people are thinking about the world of work so very differently right now. And so figuring out um, how do you keep a pulse on the culture? We also use this tool Pluto, um, which um, um, our staff can give a narrative about who they are, how they identify um, and who they wish to be. And looking at that data, um, to really, again, just keep a pulse on the culture of your organization, because um, I would say to all of you, um, moving forward as 21st century leaders, um, being really aware and in tune and listening to your folks um, will be one of the ways that you're going to retain them. And so I, I probably over communicate, I probably I'm, I'm one of those folks that I see, I notice everything. If you have a new haircut and people want to hear that, <laughs> they, they, they actually, most people anyway, they want to hear if you notice that my hair is you know, no longer light brown, but it's dark brown. All of those things matter because um, people want to feel like you, you see them as, as who they are as an individual. We spend a lot of time together. We've got to feel connected. And her. And her. And, and I tip my hat to the younger generations that are going to be heard. Like they make no qualms about it. They are going to be heard. And I have immense respect for that. They're definitely changing the game. 
All right, Naveed, any thoughts? Uh, no, I went first, I guess. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. He no, did. He did. I, did. I, I guess yeah. one, one of the things, the only thing I would add is, you know, to to some of the other points, like just redefining what, what professional actually means and how do we actually show up in the workplace is important too. So it's no longer about my representation, my, my attire. Uh, it, there, there's just so many other things to think about when it comes to um, like diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, all that work. And, and just thinking about the terms that we're used to and how do we re redefine them for the future of work. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your second answer to the same question. You got it. Um, okay, so we've got a couple questions in Q&A that we've got, and we've got a couple minutes left. So Mackenzie said, regarding removing barriers, which we had touched on earlier, how are, the, how are companies and organizations removing barriers to entry level roles to allow candidates to launch new careers? For example, some barriers I see often include requiring a bachelor's degree or higher um, and or multiple years of experience. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, one of, one of um, our key stakeholders obviously our employer partners. And so we have business solutions um, representatives who maintain relationships with our employer partners. And it's really a dialogue, right? Um, it's 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 having a conversation with the employer um, and forging that relationship, relationship, very important 21st century skill, um, where you are um, pushing on our employer partners to, to really consider um, looking at competencies is not about a degree. Um, we give certificates. But if, if I'm bringing you a candidate that is competent and can um, fill the needs that you've expressed um, that you need within your organization, and these are for entry level middle skills jobs, um, we've done really well in, in sort of um, keeping that um, conversation one where we, we've gotten um, employer partners to benefit. Um, we've also had, uh, really good luck with a conversation series, um, Diverse by Design, um, where we, we go across the nation and we hold events. We bring in HR, technology, um, and diversity um, executives and leaders into a room and really talk about um, some of the barriers that they have put up um, for folks looking for entry level and middle skills jobs and sort of talking through how can we sort of shift how they think about bringing in talent. Um, and we've had a lot of really good success with employer partners who are open. And, and at, the end of the, at the end of the day, I'm telling you, um, you know, we vet our employer partners, right? So if you're not really looking at um, diverse talent within your organization, um, and we probably don't do that as much as, okay, I made it sound like we do that all the time. Not, but I don't, I don't do huge vetting with JP Morgan Chase as an example um, of a big company, but, but I do think we need to get to a place where it's, it's two way, right? Especially at a time now where people are moving from place to place. And so, you know, employer partner, are you really looking at, and serious about bringing in diverse talent and, and having the conversation? Mm -hmm. I love that. Any other thoughts, Laura or Naveed? I would say, um, so in my past life, I, I worked quite a bit on workforce development and nonprofits in that training provider space. Um, and so oftentimes I worked with individuals who had a wealth of experience on the job uh, experience and that didn't necessarily have a college degree. Uh, and if that was the only barrier for them to get a, a, a job offer, that was very unfortunate, right? Um, but that like moving into now where we are today, I think a lot of employers are moving into the space of thinking outside the box of not necessarily requiring high school diplomas or high school or even college degrees, uh, thinking about alternative forms of credentials. Um, and, and, and I guess I would just say like one, one thing to encourage these types of conversations in the workplace, um, oftentimes, I think you can, you can just think about how many people in a specific department actually have a degree that's related to the work that they're doing today. Um, how, and if we think about like just using technology as an example, right? So when we, when we think about the labor market and the demands, there's obviously like a, a gap there. 
Um, and so how do we how do we justify that? How many 18 year olds today are deciding that they want to be a computer science major and then we'll get that degree to actually fit the, the needs that we have? Um, and so having those conversations, having those bold and courageous conversations with with leaders, um, I think is important to remove those barriers. Mm -hmm. I would just add, I think it's questioning, you know, why those requirements are in there and ensuring that it's necessary. And, you know, I'll take, for example, the years of experience, right? So maybe it's not degrees, it's experience that's required. If it's determined that, yes, that's, that's necessary for this position, then making sure that you have a diverse slate of candidates as well. And, you know, continuing to work until you have that diverse slate of candidates. You know, once you've determined that, yes, absolutely have to have this as part of the requirements, but question the requirements first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think also create space for your, you know, business partner teams, your recruiting teams, those teams to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. I think as a recruiter, I found myself off in, in several occasions asking a hiring manager, um, a, why are you still using a term like pedigree? And B, how is this degree relevant to you know, this role itself, or what are you at, you know, what are you looking for in this role um, in the qualifications? And I've actually seen those requirements change, you know? Um, so I think as, as, as we ask the questions and we start to think about those answers, that evolution happens and we kind of take down some of those barriers. Um, we have two minutes left and we have a handful of questions. So I don't, I think, Kenneth, you said you may want to come back in six months. I would love that. I think we should all talk again, because I think it's been an incredible discussion. But I will work with Angela and Janine to see if we can get some more answers to these questions um, and get them out separately. Um, but I would like to thank all of you, Naveed, Ken, and Laura, for your time today. It's been an incredible discussion, and I'm honored to have gotten to share this time with you. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for attending this first phase of the Unity Summit from One Community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.